All right, everyone. I, you know, I do have some Kleenex here in case I shed some tears because uh, this woman that I'm about to have a conversation with is already so awesome. The minute I laid eyes on her, I just knew that there, this was going to be an amazing heartfelt conversation. And wait until you hear what this woman does. This is her, her mission in life. So I wanna welcome Don Mansky. Don, thanks for joining me. Thank you so much, Susan. I'm so happy to be here. So, so everybody knows she has a company called Made of Freedom. And we're gonna be talking about that today. But first, you've gotta hear the story of how Dawn got started doing this company, what led her. So we, I'd like to hear some of the stepping stones of how, uh, of what A, what the company is, but B, what led you to do this? Because let me just read this. This is on her, on her uh, information. She, uh, Dawn created, uh, a way to empower women around the world through dignified employment, dignified employment in the fight against human trafficking, using solid ethical business practices to create systemic social change. So I said this before, Don, but I'm going to say it again. Thank you so much for your vision and what you do and that you followed your calling. I am deeply grateful personally. So what got you there? <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it was a combination of several things. I will say there were many parts that kind of brought it all together on one side. And on the other side, I'd say God dropped it in my lap <laughs> because <laughs> I was not anticipating it, never wanted to own a business, never wanted to be a business person. But these pieces that started coming together started when I was living in China. Uh -huh. And after I graduated from college, I went to China to teach English as a second language. And I ended up living in China for 10 years. So during my time there, I, I, I was an eyewitness to how vulnerable women can be or girls can be when they live in a culture that doesn't value them. Oh my God. So devaluation of the girl child is a vulnerability that I talk about frequently and, you know, going to visit orphanages and seeing it, seeing orphanages filled with little girls because the culture valued men and boys. So devaluation of the girl child was something I saw in front of me. And then there was another piece that I, a friend of mine moved to China so that she could help these kids that I knew. Uh, I, I had seen them, but she helped me understand these street kids. Actually, there were people who would go to the small, poor villages in China and look for the most vulnerable families. Oh, I'm already anticipating this story. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. And you know, they, they, these are the perpetrators. These are the procurers and they are experts at identifying vulnerabilities. And they would go and find a family that was having a rough time or a parent was out of a job or they lost a parent or any, anything and say, oh my gosh, if I take your child to the big city, there are lots of opportunities. They'll have lots of money. I can even give you a forward on the money that your child is going to make. So, so they're basically the buying the little girl it looks like a really great opportunity, but you know, that, that the way you identify human trafficking is force fraud or coercion. And here's the fraud. This is, here's the promise of a great thing. But in reality, these kids came to the big city bosses would have 15 to 20 kids in a little apartment, send them out every night at about 8 p.m. and they were forced to beg or sell little trinkets and all the money went back to the boss mm -hmm. and that was their life. So, I mean, it really was labor trafficking, um, child trafficking. But so I, I got to know some of these kids and at the time it wasn't called trafficking, but that's what it was. It was exploitation of these children. So I came back to the United States. I was in graduate school and I went to this informational lunch. And I saw a video of an undercover reporter that 
had a camera on him so you could see everything that was going on but he he went and asked somebody in Cambodia for the youngest girls he could find and and this guy took him down this back alley and took him into this little room and they ushered in maybe eight to ten girls and it just broke my heart. I mean, these girls look like they range from seven to 13. Oh my God. And, and they were offering these little girls. And I just, it, it broke my heart. It turned my stomach. And I thought, how is it that we're living in a world where little girls are growing up like this, where people want this and where adults are forcing little girls to grow up like this? Like, I just don't understand any of it. I mean, you caught me at where do people, how do people want this? That, that, that to me is a monster. Right. Right. Yeah. Like how do, how is it that this, this question alone is not repulsive to everybody, you know, but that was when I guess it kind of dawned on me, Hey, this is a much bigger issue than these kids that I knew in Beijing. I thought, you know, I guess at that point I was like, whoa, this is happening everywhere. It is a global issue that is horrifying and an atrocity. So here's this thing weighing on me. And, and unfor- like it was in every conversation when I heard somebody, you know, all upset because they didn't have the latest iPhone or something. I'm like, you don't understand problems. There are little girls being sold for sex. Mm -hmm. And every conversation kind of came back to this. And I think because I I so desperately wanted to do something and I could not figure out what. Like I knew about it. I understood it now. And I needed to do something. And I just didn't know how how to propel myself in that direction where I was part of the solution instead of just knowing about the issue. Right. So fast forward a little bit. And I ended up at a dinner with this incredibly nice, handsome young man that I had met 10 and eight years prior, but I didn't remember him. Anyway, short story, I married him. Um, (laughs) during, During our engagement, he took me to visit a friend and, you know, so that we could meet one of his groomsmen or something. And She took us to this little store and there were these sandals. And I thought, wow, I read the story on these sandals. And it was this business doing really amazing things in the lives of young ladies. Because in that situation, in that culture, young ladies went through middle school and then they had to work for a couple of years to pay for the rest of their education. The priority went to the boys which meant the girls were often left out of the education, also left out of the opportunities for careers and in more difficult situations. So it was that I I look at that moment and, and realize that's where social enterprise jumped in and was, and was like prominent in my mind. Hey, here's a way that business is not exploiting people, but empowering them. Right. And so another friend of mine came to the wedding and while I was living in China, I had vacationed in Thailand and got, I had gotten this incredibly fun pair of pants. I loved them. I could not find any more in the United States. So I begged her to bring me some fisherman pants from Thailand and she was teaching there at the time. So she said, okay, I'll bring you some pants. Um, Anyway, what the first day I'm married, right? We're going on the honeymoon. What do you think I'm wearing? The pants. Oh, I did I didn't say this. My husband ended up getting me the sandals for the wedding. So two wedding gifts. One was the pair of sandals, one was the pair these pants. And so, yeah, what am I wearing? I'm wearing the sandals and my pants. <laughs> and so, um we get a we're going through the airport to go on our honeymoon. And a TSA agent comments on my pants. Like, when was the last time that happened? You know, oh, I really like your pants. Where'd you get those? And I'm thinking, you're the TSA agent. What are you? (laughs) And then we got on the plane and the flight attendant was like, oh my gosh, I love your pants. And that was just the beginning of months of people Follow, like asking me about these pants. I'd go get ice cream with my nieces. Oh my gosh, where'd you get those pants? I want some. 
a woman literally chased me through a parking lot to ask me about the pants. So this was like the third piece, right? So here's this horrible thing happening in our world. Here's this business model called social enterprise, where you're combining social impact with business practices. And then here are these crazy pants. And my thought was, everybody seems to love these pants as much as I do. I don't really have any desire to start a business selling pants. Like I don't want to start an import company. However, if these pants could be the foundation of a business that could help people coming out of this horrible disaster, I would sell pants. So Made for Freedom was started. It was born And I started reaching out to people who were working with vulnerable women who had been exploited or were marginalized and vulnerable to Mm -hmm. exploitation. So my first partner was in Thailand and I reached out and they started making pants for us, which was phenomenal. I went on a research trip so that I could better understand what is What are the things that lead to sex trafficking? What are the things that lead to human trafficking? What are the things that make people vulnerable? But also what are the pieces that are needed to rescue and restore and reintegrate? So I was trying to educate myself on both ends of the spectrum. What's causing this, but what can be done to stop it and prevent it and restore? And I met all of these other companies and all of these other organizations working with survivors, providing therapy, providing counsel, legal services, life skills, job training, and providing jobs, making products so that the women had skills, so that they had financial stability, so that they were able to support themselves. And that was, that's kind of what these sandals were. You know, it was a social enterprise, a product that was providing, the product was a result of a job that was providing dignity and providing a good wage. And so we started partnering with centers all over the world. So Dawn, so I want to talk a bit about this uh, rescue, restore, and reintegrate that you mentioned, because how did, do you find the girls that are, that are at risk or are actually being uh, forced and trafficked? We partner with centers that are already established and doing that. So I will go quickly. Like I've mentioned a lot of different things and I like to kind of encapsulate it and just kind of put it in a working order so that it kind of makes a little more sense. But I usually use my, my hand and I just say, okay, the first part of this, it, and I call this the five, uh, five key components of exploitation. So the first part is vulnerabilities. And like I mentioned, devaluation of the girl child, extreme poverty, lack of support, friends and family, insecurity, whether it's real or just perceived not having support or being insecure for certain reasons. So mm-hmm. vulnerabilities, that's just that's just a stage. That's just a, a phase that, that is a situation. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we all are vulnerable to certain points in certain areas. I mean, you look at situations around the world and people in Ukraine didn't seem to be vulnerable before, but right now they are incredibly vulnerable. So it's, but that next part, that next key component is procures of perpetrators. Like I mentioned, those people who are experts at identifying vulnerabilities, those people who see the insecurity in a young lady, they see the poverty in a family, they see, and not only do they see it, but they take advantage of it. So you have the procurers and the perpetrators, and then you have exploitation. And exploitation, I would put that as this huge umbrella, which is human trafficking. So human trafficking encompasses several different areas. The part that I was seeing and learning about and that I was just heartbroken over was sex trafficking. And we hear a lot about that, but there is also labor trafficking. There's organ trafficking. Oh God. Ay, ay, ay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you oh know, my and, God. 
Right. Right. It, there's, there's nothing, there's nothing pretty about it. There's nothing pleasant um, about what's going on in our world with this. The one thing that has changed in the past few years, uh, and I don't know exactly when this got added, but maybe five years ago, the numbers, and they're all just estimates, like nobody really knows how many people are modern day slaves. You know, between all of the different types of human trafficking, and if you hear human trafficking, same language, modern day slavery. So yes, it makes sense. Yeah, it's the same thing. But a few, several years ago, a, a section was added because it just is very clear that there are people being taken advantage of, being exploited for someone else's benefit. And that was forced marriage. All of these young ladies that are being sold into marriage or being forced to marry someone. So, so many cultures that have been doing that for centuries. Mm -hmm. Right. And so that, that has now fallen officially under the umbrella of human trafficking. So that's exploitation. And that number before the, before the child brides or before the forced marriage was about somewhere between 27 and 32 million people. Mm. But when they added that, it, that bumped it up. So it's about 40 million people right now are living in slavery. Oh my good. And they're all women, mostly women. I, I would say mostly women, but if you look at those four, those are the main four main categories, sex trafficking, primarily women, not exclusively, but primarily Oregon trafficking is not, that's a smaller segment. And that probably goes both ways. Uh Labor trafficking, men, women, children, and the forced brides, I would say primarily females. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the majority are females. The labor trafficking is probably heavier on men, but um, all of those fall under that umbrella of human trafficking, which is exploitation. And I'm sorry, this is a very long answer to your question. I am like, (laughs) yes, please tell me more. (laughs) So that fourth component, the fourth key component is rescue and restore. Okay. So these are the things that lead up to exploitation and then exploitation there. I just gave you little bits about that, but rescue and restore a lot of people, when they hear about human trafficking, that's what they think of going on a raid, doing this, whatever, but rescue and restore one. Um, it's it's not necessarily the best thing to do to run into a brothel and grab a girl and pull her out because she has gone through this process. She's gone through the seasoning process, which is a whole completely different, horrible thing. Yeah. But and she's, sure she's indoctrinated to, and taught that this is where she's supposed to be. And yeah. that becomes her family. And right, right. And so she's already been removed from her family once mm-hmm. and she's gotten to this place and she's gone through trauma to get there. And I'm not saying they should not be rescued, right. but there are good ways to rescue people. And there are ways that are traumatic for the person. Right. But anyway, rescue and restore. That's what you think of when that's what the safe houses are, where young ladies are brought together and they are given some of those things I was mentioning, some, you know, they're giving counseling and life skills and legal help and helping prepare them to move forward in life in spite of what they've been through and in spite of some of their deficiencies because, because they were taken away from all of the things that they should have been learning during that time. And then that last piece, I would say is return and reintegrate. And that I think is one of the pieces that we most often forget. You know, we hear about a lot of these other pieces, but return and reintegrate. And that I think is a huge, that's where we kind of, we focus on two areas made for freedom. We partner with centers that are providing jobs Mm -hmm. and you are supporting yourself. You are not as vulnerable as you could be. And, but we also work with centers that are focusing on the vulnerable. So if we come across a center that is making jewelry or scarves or clothing, and they're working with people who are incredibly vulnerable, that works to prevent the exploitation. Right. If it's, 
extreme poverty, devaluation of the girl child. I mean, some of the, some of the vulnerabilities that, you know, like right now, refugees, imagine going to a country, not speaking the language, not understanding how the systems work, not understanding the government, not understanding how to get a job. How do you get a job? How do you support yourself? That, that plunges you into poverty. Right. So all of these vulnerabilities. So we partner with centers, like I said, that, sorry, I just can get going because no, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, you're giving me, so I have two pages of notes right now, Don. So you're giving me a ton of information. I love it. <laughs> so that's, that is what made for freedom does. We don't work directly with the people because when I went on these trips, when I went on these exploration slash research trips, I realized there are really incredible groups doing that hard work on the ground. They're uh-huh. running the safe houses. They're teaching the life skills. They're providing jobs for the vulnerable. They're providing jobs for the exploited. And if they're making a product and I can help them get to a larger audience, I'm helping them create jobs. Yes. So that is what we do. And I, so we're kind of that arm to help them increase what they're doing already. Mm -hmm. And so, okay. So my God, I have like 10 questions. Uh, So we're going to talk about made of freedom in in just a second. I want to go uh, to you've mostly me- mentioned, you mentioned China and Thailand, but there's, where are the other? Oh yeah. Like it, so it's not just in the, it's everywhere, right? It's not just in the Asian side of the world. No, it's, it's in, it's all over. In fact, it's in the United States. Absolutely. So I will let me, let me run through a list of some of the partners that we work with, and this will help you. This helps get a better understanding. So yes, China, we have a couple partners there. One has about five different centers that are not all in China, but, um, gosh, can I just tell you some stories about my favorite centers as I run through this list? Yes, please. Okay. Um, so this one center down in Kunming, they have locations in a couple, maybe three different countries, but they work with survivors coming out of red light districts. They have outreach teams that um, go into, like I said, the best way to rescue someone is not necessarily ripping them out of their environment. They have, this particular group has, they have outreach teams that go out every day and they get to know people in the communities. They get to know the girls working in the brothels and the red light districts. They get to know the shop owners. They get to know all these people. Um, and this story ties in with one of our pieces that I really like. It's called The Committed Heart and The Gift of Starlight. And it's this little necklace that has a piece cut out of the middle. I think okay, I saw so that we, when I was looking at the site. Yeah. It's did really you? Pretty. Okay. So that piece that's cut out of the middle, the heart or the star is made into another necklace. Those necklaces are given to girls through the outreach teams. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the, the necklace, the inside piece that we don't have is given to these outreach teams that go into the community every day and they give them to girls still working in red light districts. And they say, we don't want anything from you, but we want you to know that you are valuable and someone wearing the other part of this is standing for your freedom. Oh my God, I got chills. That's brilliant. That is so brilliant. Isn't that, so you can wear, you can wear this necklace and you know that with that, there is a, there is a young lady who is, who at least has been in the middle of exploitation, possibly has come out, but they have girls that come back to them and wearing the necklace and say, I remember what you said, and I'm ready. I'm ready to leave this life. How can you help me? And it seems to me, Dawn, that if, if the, if the girl finally comes to a place where she's ready to do that, then the rehabilitation and re-entry into a better life is more possible than taking somebody who's still indoctrinated. Yes. 
Uh, yes, that is so tr It's true of all of us. When we are ready to make a move, then it's, then it's, it's actually more likely to happen. Yeah. But, I I'm, I'm like, don't, don't tell me what to do. I'll right. do it when I'm good and ready. <laughs> I will walk the other ready, way. Oh, well, <laughs> Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We are stubborn people. We are humans. And are. so, yeah, so exactly these girls. So anyway, that necklace and these outreach teams, but another thing that's that particular group, one, when I went to visit them, they told me about uh, one of the brothel owners that they got to know, like they just build relationships. And I thought, what are you doing getting to know the brothel owners? Sounds this kind of dangerous to me. Right. But you know what? This brothel owner started to understand the value of women and people. And she told, she brought all of her girls together at one point And she said, go back to your families. Don't ever do this again. And she turned her space into a restaurant. Oh my goodness. Okay. So that's like, that is, it, it shows that. Okay. So <laughs> when I, I just got to say this to everybody, I've mentioned it several times on empowering chance, but when apartheid was happening in South Africa and Desmond Tutu mm. said to people that had been abused, right, battered and abused, um, at, who wanted to get back at the perpetrators. And he said, you, you, no, the, the best way is to give them dignity so they can stand up and change. And you do that through forgiveness. Mm on a very, very high level. So it sounds like, so it sounds like as these young women that were in the brothel were contemplating, or maybe, you know, it's, I, I really believe that whole butterfly effect, you know, mm -hmm. if somebody, if one person has a really loving, kind thought, it, if it just ripples out and that, and it's true for all of us, if we really center into our, the center of our heart, where spirit resides, and mm. radiate that out, it can change the world. And so for a brothel owner to do a, mm -hmm. a right. 180, 360, oh my, you know, and that's her income. Right, right. Wow, that's amazing. Okay. So that's of one of our centers. Woman, right, it was a woman. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a woman. So that's one of the centers we partner with. Um, and then we have this other, I met, this group, I've met the founder of this organization when I was doing a trip to India. India, like China, massive population. Right. The evaluation of the girl child is pretty significant. Poverty can be extreme. There is one, not, not the entirety of the red light districts in the city. So there's a city called Kolkata, sorry, Calcutta mm -hmm. in English. The Indian way to pronounce it is Kolkata. Kolkata has multiple red light districts. One of them is called Sonagachi and it has over 11,000 women being prostituted out. So the numbers, just because of the population and because of other cultural things, like there are things like that are just hard for our brains to even wrap around, but that's the situation. He and his wife started this place. They, they moved, they were right on the edge of this red light district. They didn't even realize it. And he was like, I know what I need to do. Mm -hmm. And he started this company and they started making t-shirts and they would get to know the ladies in the red light district and say, you know, you have other options. There are other things that you can do with your life. So our t-shirts come from this center. And now they also do the screen printing. Like previously that was kind of a bottleneck, but I've been back a couple of times to visit and I love going to visit the center, but they work with ladies coming out of this red light district. They teach them how to read. Some of these ladies never even knew how to read. They didn't know how to sign their name, oh, good but grief. they work with them on reading, writing. They teach them how to sew, or if they're not very good at sewing, which happens on occasion, you know, the I'm owner, horrible. right. The owner said, you know, they have like a three week training that they'd run pretty much everyone through and, you know, but they also develop these skills and they become leaders and they, be, you know, they help with different parts of the business. But, you know, he said there was this one lady and she just could not sew a straight line for life. And they said, you know what, we need tags put on the t-shirt, <laughs> So, <laughs> you know, it's finding where the person fits. So our t-shirts are sewn and screen printed by women coming out of this red light district. And they go back into the red light district and they talk to other girls that are still working there and they go, there's more to life than you, you can do more than this. 
So that's where our t-shirts come from. Um, Red Light District. I have a question, John. Yes. Um, in terms of when somebody go when somebody buys your products, where does that money go to? Because I'm really big about if I'm going to donate, which mm -hmm. this is you get something if you buy something, right? But if I'm going to give money to a nonprofit, I want to make sure it goes to like the U Ukrainian ref refugee effort or whatever. Right, right. And the easiest, I would say, when you buy Made for Freedom product, there are two main places it goes. One, it goes to that center. It pays for the materials of the product. It pays that woman's salary. Okay. It, and we pay a higher price. I will tell you, we pay a higher price for our products. I don't, I don't buy stuff from a sweatshop. I don't buy stuff from a factory. I pay I pay pay a premium price for our products because these centers are offering life skills training. I'm paying for a lot of that cushion in our products. And the and other I would pref I would prefer to pay for it too. Do you know what I mean? I would much rather make sure that my money is going, you know, there are particular big box companies I do not spend my money at. Right. right. I will not. Mm -hmm. because it's, it, it is, it's taking advantage of people that can't protect. Right. Them. Right. Um, and I'd say the other part of the money that you spend on made for freedom products is helping us grow. The more people we can get in front of, the more products we sell, the more jobs are created because that's made for freedom really isn't here for any other purpose. I mean, our in the way we measure our impact is hours of dignified employment because it has become so abundantly clear when someone is vulnerable and you give them dignified employment, the vulnerabilities lessen. When yes. someone has been exploited and they are given dignified employment, they're not going to become vulnerable again, you know, because so often that's how they ended up there. Because right, they, they didn't know vulnerable. how to take care of themselves or provide for themselves or their right. families. Right. And so then, then this, then dignified employment, get, they, they never have to go back there again. Right. 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 Because there's another option. Okay. So made for freedom. Yes. Um, you're, so you sell jewelry, t-shirts, pants. You know, <laughs> Our first partners, the whole thing is about pants, right? How long did right. I talk about these? Right, right, right. Pants? <laughs> I love these pants. Our first partner was in Thailand and they did an amazing job. And after several orders and they made bags for us, they made pants, they made all sorts of stuff. And then I got an email from the director and she said, our ladies are getting incredible opportunities to further their education and start careers. That's amazing, right? That's what we want. So that, yeah. So that's the whole, then, then you get to the end game and now you got to find other things to. Right. And then the email continued and we are no longer sewing. <laughs> so, so we are in the process right now. I, my last trip to India, I met with a new supplier. They are providing dignified employment for survivors coming out of a different red light district in India. And they do an amazing job with pants. So we are in the process of working on it. Actually, what we did was we took the fisherman pant and we changed the design a little bit. And I thought, well, we changed the pattern. So we probably should change the name because it's not your traditional fisherman pant. And I thought, well, I need a name that really represents what these pants are about. And so we came up with a name and we call them Crea belly pants, but the word Crea belly comes from creating a beautiful life. <gasps> again, chills. I mean, again, chills. And I heard it when, right, right before you said that creating a beautiful life. Oh mm. my goodness, Dawn. Oh my goodness. <laughs> this so, is what you've been doing for so many. Mm. I, I said this again, before we started, uh, thank you so much for your vision and your willingness to follow your calling and your service. I, I'm just, I'm in awe of you. And for somebody who never wanted to go into business, honey, I'm so <laughs> glad you did. Oh my gosh. Thank you. So now, so made for freedom, is yeah. it made for freedom.org or.com? 
dot com. We have we do have a nonprofit arm as well, and I have a video podcast. I that we've had one season and haven't quite picked it up again, but I keep hearing these stories about people who are stepping in to prevent or restore those who are vulnerable. And I just wanted to share some of those stories. So Made for Freedom Foundation, we have a YouTube channel uh, with our impact conversations. Okay. But we madeforfreedom.com is the business side. And that is where we focus exclusively on getting these incredible products out to a larger audience. So we have, oh, so we have the t-shirts, we have jewelry, we have bath, we have candles and bath salts and soaps from a group in Nash, uh, Nashville that is working with women coming out of abusive relationships and God. they yes. domestic violence survivors yes. and another group that's working with refugees and immigrants in St. Louis and teaching them how to sew so that they can support themselves. And another group that was working with survivors coming out of Chicago so bath and body, um, baby, we have some really cute onesies, like hand applique, the oh refugee immigrants, little giraffes and elephants and llamas. And so cute little tooth fairy pillows. I never had a tooth fairy pillow, but everybody's like, <laughs> oh, those say. are so great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me see. So scarves, bags. Oh, we've got, we've got a really nice selection of bracelets. This group that's working in Kolkata, we're getting a new order of bracelets, hopefully in the next month or so with some really fun designs. It's a piece of bamboo. So it's a very sustainable product, but also some great messaging and justice and joy. And anyway, um, I see, and I hear (laughs) your passion for doing this. Um, and what I'm also hearing is when the product is, is, um, delivered it, there's a short, uh, availability because it's right. Sometimes that, yeah, sometimes that is true. Sometimes we're able to get larger quantities, but, uh, you know, like one of our necklaces sells really well and it's a stainless steel bar and it has writing on three sides and it says, seek justice, love mercy, walk humbly. Oh and my goodness. That's beautiful. The, it's, it is a beautiful piece. We have a key ring that's like it, but I, I have had we've sold a lot of those. It's one of our best sellers. And I've had people come up to me years later and say, I wear this all the time. And here's, I love this. I go to some conferences where there are prosecutors who are prosecuting perpetrators and traffickers. And I've had prosecutors come back and wearing the necklace and they hold it up and they say, every time I go to court, I wear this so that I remember what my job is. Oh, that's brilliant. And I love that our products not only are providing dignified employment, but my, the customers come back to me on a regular basis. They're like, oh my gosh, I love my purse. When I took this to the doctor's office, they asked me about it. I said, let me tell you about my purse. This was, you know, and our customers actually become our advocates because yes, when someone comments, yeah, when someone comments on it, you're like, oh my gosh, let me tell you the story behind this. This is right. providing dignified employment for survivors of trafficking. So it's it's really been fun to kind of see the elements and the different pieces that get tied into all of the different levels of the business. Well, Don Maskey, I am so grateful I got to I got to meet you and see you and hear your story and everybody made for freedom and there, and you can also look for their nonprofit foundation there. Mm -hmm. And, um, thank you so much again. I just feel like I'm, I'm like just goobering all over you with my, my, uh, (laughs) how how impressed I am, but thank you so much, Don. I really, really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for letting me, letting me share and, and for what you're doing to just get the word out about people doing significant things. It's, it's wonderful. Absolutely. And it's important that women empower women. So yes. Yeah. Yes. So I'm just going to end with, and so it is namaste. Mm-hmm.